down the amount of heavier elements who go down uh, and you can see a spectrum there that's about uh, an order and a half magnet of magnitudes um, down in in iron i'm using iron here as the reference uh, element and you can see much fewer lines are visible in the spectrum the little wiggles now that is actually noise in the data because we can't get as good a data for, for stars than you can get for the sun and then if you go progressively down you get to the bottom line and there's that's basically essentially noise except for one little blip at 3860. So that tiny little blip, I hope you can see it on your small screens, is the strongest iron line in the stellar spectrum and there's not much left. So that one has a metallicity of less than minus five in iron and that's what we consider a second generation star. So that one is a nice example for how low it gets. That would be one, one on 250 thousands of the solar ion abundance. And uh, so, well, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the periodic table. Um, there's hydrogen and there's helium and then there are all the other elements combined. And because the universe is a complicated place, some astronomers, as you probably know, uh, decided that, yeah, this is all way too complicated. Let's just call it all metals. So I've used the term already, but just to formally introduce it. Uh, so when I talk about a metal, I mean any element <laughs> and sometimes all elements combined uh, that are heavier than hydrogen and helium. Uh, and so accordingly, we look for the most metal poor stars uh, when we look for the older stars because they have the smallest amounts of heavy elements in them. So that was uh, some introduction on the same page about old stars because we need to know this for our story here of Reticulum 2. Uh, it comes in three parts. There is uh, a nuclear astrophysics part where we'll talk a little bit about the origin of the elements, the heavy elements. Then stellar archaeology, how we get clues to the astrophysical side of the R process and I'll, I'll tell you in detail what the R process means. We'll add dwarf galaxy archaeology because we can do stellar archaeology not just with stars but also with entire dwarf galaxies. All right, let's uh, start with a little primer, a little refresher here on nucleosynthesis. Well, no secret in the universe how elements up to iron are made. They are made in fusion processes. You have lighter elements that fuse to heavier ones. And you can see that in this little cartoon there. And once you reach iron nuclei, then that's what you're stuck with because fusing two iron atoms would take energy and not gain or get, get you any energy out. So the star doesn't like that. Um, and uh, during stellar evolution it goes exactly up to iron and then the star ends up with an iron core and then it'll explode because it has lost its uh its energy source um but we're not really concerned here about uh, these lighter elements because the fusion processes are pretty well understood but what about all the other elements in the periodic table because there are actually many more elements that are heavier than iron and so they come from predominantly uh, from neutron capture processes. Now there are two different types, the slow neutron capture process and the uh, rapid one. Um, the chart that's shown here, that actually refers to the slow process. So I'll, I'll explain that briefly because then it's actually easier to get what the rapid process is. So you have, um, can you see my, my mouse? Yes. Um, yes. Great. Uh, so you have, um, so, well, you start with a seed nucleus. It could be iron, could be this one here. And if you're in an environment that has a lot of neutrons in it, and we'll talk about where the neutrons come from in a second, um, you can bombard that poor iron atom with neutrons. And if you just throw one neutron at it, you'll make, uh, you know, it becomes a neutron rich isotope. This is a piece here of the charts of the nuclei. This is number of um, uh, neutrons and up here is number of protons. So 
you add neutrons and you you go along this way blop 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 you add another one but oh this one is uh, you know unstable so it decays back so one neutron gets turned into a proton you move diagonally back up here and then um you know you wait a little bit and you add another neutron and then oop it's unstable you know this isotope here so it decays to that and then you can uh, because the beta decay half-lives are long enough you can like add a few neutrons blah 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 and then so you zigzag this way up along this path here which is the um, valley of beta stability um, and i have another cool uh, video to show in a, in a moment so this is how you make heavy elements you kind of zigzag up there and then depend uh, and then you you can create all sorts of isotopes now the rapid neutron capture process um as the name suggests is rapid because now you take your ion seed nucleus and you bombard it with neutrons but with tons of neutrons within the half-life of the beta decays of these isotopes so this nucleus doesn't know what's happening it gets bombarded with new with with neutrons and it swells really really bad just uh, like you see um, in in this cartoon here now um, and uh, only when the neutron flux stops then it all decays back to to beta stability so this is what we mean with a rapid neutron capture process and i have um, oh, here let's see if this works it sometimes takes a second to load um, here's the full charts of the nuclei and these little um, squares here this is the valley of beta stability though so this is where all the stable isotopes live in this chart again neutrons protons um, and when we have a seed nucleus and the simulation here starts with just a proton as a seed nucleus um, it doesn't really matter in the end uh, because you can build an ion nucleus also through uh, neutron capture then you know by adding neutrons it will shoot down here all the way up and then it will decay so i'll uh, try to run this here yeah so boom this is now you have all these neutron rich isotopes that live way down here so really really neutron rich and then now the neutron flux stops and it all decays towards this here and if you look at the time we're at 30 seconds now so this is probably the only simulation that goes slower than real life. And certainly in, in astronomy, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely the other way around, right? The little galaxy formation simulation I showed you up front, that was billions of years in 30 seconds. And so here we have a process that goes within two seconds. So all the neutron rich isotopes are created within two seconds. And then the decay process takes a few more weeks. I mean, we're at 30 years now, but as you can see, not much has changed uh, recently there. So, um, good. So I'm going to show it again because I want to I want to highlight one specific thing. Um, I think I can do it here for your amusement and also to highlight a, a, a bigger picture. So we're still in the neutron flux at 100, 200 milliseconds. And now I'm going to say kilonova because I hope you are all familiar with the LIGO results from a couple of years ago uh, that where a gravitational, gravitational event was observed, including a neutron star merger. And there was an electromagnetic um, counterpart observed by the astronomers. And what did they observe? They observed the, the flux that emerged from this event uh, across the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's supposed to have been the afterglow of an R process event. And so on this chart here, you can actually perfectly see what the ob observers found. Because as soon as the neutron flux stops, this is when stuff decays, starts to decay. And this is where all this light comes out, right, from the decay. And this is exactly what the kilonova was. And so I think this is a really nice 
highlight or a connection of um, the nuclei and the cosmos. So here we're looking at the charts of the nuclei, but we're talking about a cosmic event like a kilonova. So we can see nucleosynthesis in action uh, <laughs> during a kilonova. So very exciting. All right, so which elements are produced? Um, the previous chart was an isotopic chart. Um, we cannot observe isotopes or isotopic abundances but we do it for, for whole elements. So you've got to group all the isotopes together into its elements. And then um, the R process here produces all the blue elements, including thorium and uranium, they are right at the bottom. They are not stable, but they are long lived. Thorium has a half-life of 14 billion years and uranium has a half-life of 4.7 billion years. Um, that already indicates you that it could actually be interesting for age dating purposes. I won't have time to go into that, but we are also trying to do that here now. So all these elements are made in the R process and then you can see uh, the colors of the remaining light elements that come from these, these other um, uh, sites and, and processes. Now, just for completeness, I want to also show you what the S process makes. The S process makes actually the exact same elements but they don't have the same isotopic compositions. So the devil's in the detail. Um, you really got to, uh, in the end, figure out what the isotopes look like if you want to know the details. However, the abundance patterns, or one consequence of that is that the abundance patterns, as we can observe it in stars, and I'll start talking about this in a moment, are very different. So we can actually distinguish between that. And most importantly, the S process does not get to thorium and uranium. It stops at lead. That's the end of lead and, and bismuth. And then, of course, I also have to show you what the sun looks like, because I already said that the sun is the product of 8 billion years of chemical evolution. And um, you can see here the, the relative distributions of how the S and the R process have contributed to the inventory of the gas cloud from which the sun formed. So europium, for example, um, my mouse has disappeared, but europium is number 63 at the bottom. In the middle there, uh, you have only a tiny little red S process contribution. So it's mostly made in the R process. Whereas barium, which is number 56 on the left, um, has only a small um, R process contribution. So it's mostly made in the, in the S process in the solar nebula. So that's what, what 8 billion years of chemical evolution will find. <laughs> Good. Um, if we take these abundances and plot them uh, now up, you know, the abundances of, um, that you saw in the isotopic chart. So the R process itself sets this abundance pattern. And this is what it looks like when you, when you plot it as a function of the atomic number. So this is the elemental pattern. And it has three so-called peaks. The first peak around strontium, yttrium, zirconium. The second peak around uh, tellurium and iodine and xenon. And then the third peak is osmium, iridium, and platinum. And um, why am I showing this to you? Well, because people have found this in stars. And so, ah, thank you. <laughs> um, but before I tell you what the stars look like, let me just tell you that uh, this is an old problem. 